Welcome to Nuked Radio, episode 10. Today is Friday, March 23rd, 2012. With me today is Jules and Popeye from Federal Jack. He's a show on Orion that you should really check out Wednesdays and Fridays from 10 to 12. Eastern Standard Time, and Sundays from 5 to 7. We were supposed to have Kevin Allen on today to talk about uh, detox and mitigation, and I dropped a link to his website in chat for you guys. He's having some technical issues. In fact, we all are this morning, and computers are running really slow, so we'll keep our fingers crossed that we get through the show okay. And we have some important news to share about Reactor 2. There's some stuff going on there, but um, first of all, I wanted to address the Wisconsin booms again. And AP had a uh, report this morning that they have determined what the source of the booms are. In fact, Popeye is going to roll the clip for us. Behind those things going boom in the night in northeast Wisconsin has been solved. The U.S. Geological Survey says a magnitude 1.5 earthquake struck the town of Clintonville Tuesday night. Scientists tell city officials that it was actually a swarm of tiny earthquakes. Our community did in fact experience an earthquake that registered 1.5 on the earthquake magnitude scale. They believe that the event is shallow, but do not know how shallow. And due to the fact that we could all hear such prominent noises, it may be even more shallow than determined. Geologists also told city officials that the type of rock that's common in Wisconsin could transmit the quake's seismic energy, resulting in loud noises. Matt Small, the Associated Press. It's very strange, you know, I mean, there is there is um, usually no seismic activity in the area. In fact, any time I've checked the graphs when we've had earthquakes, the Wisconsin graphs have always been flatlined. But, you know, a, a couple weeks ago there was an earthquake north of Chicago, in an area where they never knew there was a fault before. And there was a guy on YouTube yesterday named Norton2012 who um, put out a video. He lives in the area, and he wanted to determine um, the cause of it and said he was on top of the situation. He actually dug up some research that was done in the 1950s from a geoscientist that said, and he published three times about the same thing, that there, there are faults that go through Wisconsin that have never been uh, surveyed before. And no one's ever picked up on that research. So it's going to be interesting to see how this goes. The the people in that area are really shook up. And then, you know, the nuke plant, too, when they checked it for its uh, seismic um, ability to withstand earthquakes, they had a problem with the cooling tubes at at Kewanee nuke plant. So uh, I, I haven't seen anything on the NRC's website posted about that yet. If it's been fixed. Uh, Christina. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, it's not like you see much seismic activity in Wisconsin. <laughs> I mean, no. they're, they're definitely not known for it. But I don't know if you saw, just speaking of a little more seismic, did you see in southern Australia um, – couple hours back they had a 5.6 on the continent you typically don't see that i mean you see it like in um in the island chains off the east coast of venatu is that what it's called they've had a lot there they've had a few down in the southern tip near tasmania and then um up north to indonesia but very rare to see something that large in the center of australia yeah, so, uh, it, yeah, it really is because that um, the Pacific Plate kind of curves around Australia. Yeah, and that's I mean, where that's yeah, a- Fiji and New Zealand and Christchurch that gets hit all the time. Uh, Tonga, that whole area. I mean, they're they're used to quakes, but I I can't recall ever seeing a quake on the the continent of Australia, especially right in the middle. Let me ask you, lady, something. Do you think that maybe some of these quakes could be? man-made or helped along by man's hand in one way shape or form well there's been a lot of recent news about like fracking and how fracking may be causing because a lot of the places where they get into the ground more easily is along fault areas where they're looking for um for natural gas deposits and then you know in order to get the gas out they have to inject stuff into the ground and it's usually like diesel oil that they inject to get the gas out (laughs) Well, you know, one of the things, too, that I was thinking, I mean, once the plates 
moved such a large distance after the Japan earthquake last year. I mean, everything needs to kind of now move back into place. Um, definitely questionable as to what happened at Japan. I mean, we talked about that yesterday with the ionosphere heating up and that. Um, but I saw this morning, too, there have been quite a number of quakes now in the Middle East. And um, oh, where was it this morning? It was in one of the, the seas very near Iran. There's been a lot of seismic activity. And I was really raising an eyebrow to that. It just seemed a little suspicious at this time that... Uh, you know, they're starting to have an uptick in seismic activity in that area. Ever since we sent warships to that strait, they've been having earthquakes around there. Did so you guys ever see the videos of weather manipulation over in the Middle East from a couple of years ago? Like out, out in the waters off, like in the Persian Gulf off Iran? There's videos where uh, it's supposedly people are saying it was it's proof of weather manipulation out there because there's, there's video from a boat. And it's an Iranian fisherman taking the, the video, and it's a, uh, a funnel cloud coming right down into the middle of the Persian Gulf, like just forming out of nowhere, literally these clouds forming up, and you see the funnel cloud come down and just go right into uh, the Gulf, and there's this god-awful noise in the background. Really strange. No, I haven't seen that. The if you ever find it, drop that to me, because that would be interesting. Saudi Arabia was right able to, um, was able to create snowstorms. In the desert, using their weather modification program. Yep, Dubai as well. They mm -hmm. made it rain in the desert. Dubai made grass grow in the desert where there hadn't been grass for like over 100 years. Wow, but we have so, a food shortage. and you But know. weather modification is not yeah. real, ladies. Yeah. We're conspiracy theorists for believing that we have that type of technology. <laughs> Even though Michio Kaku, Mr. New World Order himself there, he goes on TV and talks all the time that says a type 1 civilization will be a civilization that control the, controls the weather and the planet. But, but we're crazy. He goes on national TV and says that we're type 0. And that if once we became type 1, to become type 1, you know, you'd have to have control of the planet, control of resources, and control of the weather to be able to be a quote-unquote type 1. But I'm crazy because I say we have weather manipulation technology, and this guy's on national television saying that's where we're headed. But I'm crazy. Yeah. Yeah, they're playing God is what they're doing, and then we, you can't you know, help but notice all the, the other things that are, are happening, especially with the mass animal deaths that are continuing. I mean, it wasn't just in January of 2011. There's a, a Google map that someone's been keeping up with um, of, of just the list of animal deaths in the, in the last few months. I mean, it's extraordinary. And yeah, that actually started like toward the end of 2010, and it has been continuing up until present day. Yeah, so who knows how all these things interact with each other? Well, did you see yesterday there apparently was an official report? It was funny that we talked about BB Arkansas yesterday, but there was an official report that came out um, from what the issue was and they continued it on with the farce that it could have been fireworks it could have been weather it could have been whatever but the autopsy still showed blunt force trauma and blood clots in the birds mm -hmm. well a lot of people were were speculating that it had something to do with harp at the time and it, until i saw that video with arto lori um the radiation large clouds of radiation passing over us made more sense to me yeah Especially for how widespread they were. But, uh, yeah, a lot of things we just won't ever have answers to unless, uh, you know, some, some of these people that uh, are working on these programs lose their jobs and get angry and then come forward and tell us what's really going on. And that's how we find out a lot of times that these conspiracies are true. Whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. Thank God for whistleblowers. Yeah, and look at this administration. Look how hardcore they're going after whistleblowers more than any other administration. Gee, I wonder why. Yeah, life in prison. Jules, and did, torture. You, did you see a story yesterday that um, they've now made it illegal to feed homeless people? Yes, we talked about that on Kurt's show yesterday. What uh, the New heck? York, I guess they've been doing that in Florida for a while, haven't they, Papa? Yeah, the city of Orlando did that. Yeah. And they're not the only one. There's other cities around the country, too, but Orlando is a glaring example. Anonymous went after them for it a couple months back, remember? Well, good. I do. Somebody needs to. All right, we'll be back with Nuked Radio in just a moment. And we are.
are back with Nuked Radio. There's some important news today about hydrogen levels are triple at reactor number two in recent days. And when we had a problem with the, the temperature, it was going up in January. TEPCO said, oh, well, the thermometers must be broken. Now it's the hydrogen is going up, which is an indication that the temperature is rising. In fact, they said it was 80 degrees Celsius, I think, two days ago. Uh, TEPCO has stopped monitoring two more thermometers at the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Unit 1. TEPCO admitted one of the thermometers measuring the reactor vessel temperature has been found to be inoperable due to a wiring mistake that's 10 years old. The faulty wire connections that were made years ago during regular inspection were judged to be short-circuited and inoperable. On Thursday, TEPCO found that one of the other thermometers was connected to the data recorder by way of a jumper instead of the field thermometer. So the readings taken by the data recorder were actually duplicates. You know so what's really it? scary? You know what's really scary about this? Hmm. That they, they, they don't even really monitor. I mean, if they are monitoring, they're not telling you the, the reality of what they're monitoring. And when they do give you a tidbit of a real reading, it is so astronomical that nobody wants to even believe it. People think you're out of your, oh, no, that's got to be a typo. That's got to be a mistake. And that's, not, that's just an infinitesimal little fraction of what they're telling you. Yeah, well, every time something goes high over there, it's like, oh, well, the, the, it must not be recording the data right. I saw <laughs> this morning on uh, Lucas's um, feed through Informidable mm-hmm. that uh, the temperatures, you know how they were going up in reactor one and two? Yeah. Well, now they've just disabled the thermometers. <laughs> so now they just don't have to worry about it. And, you know, nobody can get close enough to the buildings to even put new thermometers there. Yeah. Or, like, so snake just... them in like they did with the endoscope because the levels are too high. That was posted last week around reactor two and three. It's so high, no one can even go near the buildings now. Their robots are getting fried going yeah. in there. Because yep. the radiation levels are so high, it's frying the circuitry in the robots that were made to go in there in an emergency. But no, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, that radiation is not coming over here. There's a wall between Asia and the United States, and it's a radiation wall. It's invisible. The government put it up. It's there to protect you. Have no fear. You don't have to monitor anything. Don't worry about it. And they're in cold shutdown. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, and, you know, people... Crazy. People are so asleep, ladies, it's like they're not even, oh, okay, well, the government says it's okay. You know, the government said they cleaned up the BP oil spill, even though oil is still coming on shore. But don't look at the oil. It's gone. The emperor has no clothes. Now, are they, you seeing oil, just to kind of stay on that topic for one second? Oh, yeah, the, the Gulf Coast is not on my side because I'm on the East Coast, but I know people on the Gulf Coast. And every time a big storm comes through and hurricane season is coming back up again, and every time hurricane season comes through, even if it's a tropical storm, it shakes the bottom of the ocean up. And that's where all that oil is sitting. It didn't go away. It's just sitting there in this layer of crap on the bottom. And as soon as the storm comes through, it picks up a large amount of it, sends it towards the, the coast. And within the next 12 hours, the coast is covered in crap, whether it be tar balls, big chunks of, you know, like gooey oil. And now it's got all that Corexit crap mixed in it, so God knows what kind of science experiment it, it has. <clears throat> excuse me, it has become on the bottom of that ocean floor. It is really nasty out there. I mean, when you start looking at what we've done to the oceans, I mean that um, that tsunami debris is still on its way. Um, you know, we've seen the plume map uh, of the the radiation coming over in the ocean from Japan. Now. Uh, Christina and Papa, didn't we – I saw something the other day that I think uh, Alex might have put out about the plume hitting Hawaii. Is yeah. that true? There, the simulation shows that it's hitting Hawaii right now, but I haven't seen anything confirmed in the way of readings of anybody doing any testing. Has anyone talked to Shep? I mean, does Shep have any type of insight? He's not in uh, – I, I know he's not in the islands anymore. I know he's back in the mainland. So uh, I don't know That's if right. he – I'm sure he probably – Shep obviously knows people out there. I should probably hit him up and ask him if he knows anything. But uh, I haven't heard anything per se, you know, per se like numbers or any radiation levels or anything coming out of there yet. If there's anybody listening in Hawaii, go out. If you have a Geiger counter, if you know somebody, go out and start taking readings and keep an eye on it. Spread the word to somebody that might have a Geiger counter. 
Call up uh, Mike Rivero over at What Really Happened. He's based out of Hawaii. Tell him he does two radio shows a day. He's got a huge website. Contact him and ask him to see if, you know, he can put a word out there to his listeners, too. Because this is something that's, you know, it, you sh- it it's not, oh, well, you know, I'll look out for myself. No, we need to look out for everybody. We Everybody needs to take care of each other. It doesn't matter what alternative media outlet they are. It, it, we all need to band together on this because we're the only ones that are going to be talking about this and putting this information out. The government don't care. Look what Canada did. They turned yeah. their monitors off. Just like we did. Um, I do know on Radiation Network we have a couple guys out of Hawaii, but I haven't really seen anything much from them. So I might drop a note into the chat there, too, and see if we can get some numbers. Yeah, speaking of Canada, I had an article up that I was planning on reading today from Alexander Higgins. And this was dated August 4th, 2011. Major paper, Canada government covered up massive amounts of radiation in air. And this is actually published in a mainstream article. And Alexander Higgins wrote, while the alternative media has reported on a cover-up of the Fukushima nuclear fallout, throughout the disaster we haven't seen a mainstream news source do much more than act as a stenographer for the government and the nuclear industry through the ordeal. This could clearly be seen in the nuclear fallout maps, which he has posted um, under the article, and I'll drop a link into chat. To be fair, Forbes blogger Jeff McMahon called out the government for switching their so-called safety levels off, but really haven't heard much from him since. The rest of the media has been silent. Today, a major Canadian paper has finally lashed out at the government of Canada after finally coming to the realization the cronies knew about the cover-up of massive amounts of radioactive material from Fukushima in Canadian air. Of course, this is in reference to British Columbia in Alberta, who really got hurt, hit the worst, and continue to. So, um, shame on this man for spewing the nuclear apologist talking point while the population is at a higher risk and, and saying the risk to the individual is small. You know, the thing, again, like Popeye said, yeah, there's an invisible wall up. So, if Canada got hit with heavy amounts of radiation, we didn't? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And did you see the, the birth, what was it, the the infant mortality rate, that's what it was, in uh, around the Seattle area and the, 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 the West Coast area of, uh, I think it was just in Seattle and maybe one or two other cities uh, in Washington State there. But in that area alone, right after Fukushima, uh, the infant mortality rate went up like 38% or something like that, 30-something 30 percent somewhere around there. Yeah. Might be a couple numbers off, but just go look. You got, you'll see it from a couple months ago. It's yeah, incredible. Has, has any... Um, Updates come out on that, Christina? Because no, I've been this, looking. What this article says is some impacts may have already occurred in North America. Infant mortality in eight cities in the U.S. Northwest jumped 35% after Fukushima, according to an article by internist and toxicologist Janet Sherman and epidemiologist Joseph Magango on the Counterpunch website in June. The number of infant deaths rose from 9.25 per week in the four weeks prior to March 19th to 12.5 per week in the following 10 weeks, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control data. But, you know, Canada, they don't have numbers like that. That's all tracked through their socialized medicine program, but it's not shared with the public. So they just have no idea. And I have very few Canadians on any of my websites or on YouTube. I mean, there's a couple people that are tuned into this in the area, but not nearly enough. Maybe the debris field will wake them up a little. We'll be back with Nuked Radio. Radio. I wanted to share an article also um, 
along the Canadian lines again. Canadians have been subjected um, in the past to uh, weaponized mosquitoes. And I've, I've actually seen the research study that was done. It was actually on the Internet a few months ago. Now I couldn't find it today, but I did find a related article. Testing brucellosis via mosquito vector in Ontario. The government of Canada established the Dominion Parasite Laboratory in Belleville, Ontario, and raised 100 million mosquitoes a month, which were shipped to Queen's University and certain other facilities to be infected with this d disease agent. The mosquitoes were then let loose in certain communities in the middle of the night so they could determine how many people would become ill with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, which was the first disease to show. One of the communities they tested it in was the St. Lawrence Seaway Valley all the way from Kingston to Cornwall in 1984. They let out hundreds of millions of mosquitoes that were infected and over 700 people in the next four or five weeks developed myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. Christina, you need to send me that article. In the 80s, can I just tell you, we used to go camping up to uh, the Thousand Islands, which is right on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh -huh. And there were so many mosquitoes that as soon as the sun started to go down, you had to get inside. They were like swarming. But do you know my mother for the last 20 years has been battling fibromyalgia? Well, I have it and my mother has it and three of my four kids have it too. And we spent a lot of time since the mid-80s in southern Ontario. In fact, my parents moved there in 1987. And we used to go to the beach there all the time. And, you know, everything we did there was outdoors. And I couldn't help but wonder if that's where this came about in our family. And, you know, fibromyalgia is a, is a very painful disease. It's um, your, your neurotransmitters in your brain don't block pain at all. And it was part of the reason I started using um, cannabis, too, to control pain, because I was on, like, six different medications just for fibromyalgia. So it's, uh, you Which know. Which makes it worse, because then you have side effects from the medication. Well, yeah, then you have stomach problems. You yeah, have to take it's something horrible. for your stomach. Then you can't sleep, so you need a sleeping pill. And it just goes on and on and on. And then, you know, you're depressed because you're taking all these things, and you still feel like crap. Nope, you and know, then you quit. You quit doing all that, and you use medical cannabis. One, just one thing, and it, it natural, and it it clears up. It clears up all your problems, at least to a point where you don't have to take all those pills all the time anymore. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Big farm is a joke, man. My wife used to, um, back in the day, uh, she used to have to take certain medications uh, for a condition that she said, you know, she supposedly had, and they kept pushing it on her for years and years and years. And finally, one day she said to me, I don't think these, these doctors know what they're talking about because she had seen a couple different doctors and it was like the three stooges for real. So we said, why don't we try where you don't do anything? We, we, you don't take any of the big pharma medications and you just we change the way you eat, your diet, your intake, vitamins and everything else uh, in diatomaceous earth, that, that type of thing. And it's been over a year and she feels 110% better than she ever did on any of those big pharma meds. And she's doing better. She doesn't have any problems whatsoever that she was having medically. So where were the problems really coming from? Mm -hmm. what, was it the medication that was causing the problems? And then they were just saying they would, you know, mask that with another medication to, you know, you know take this for this problem and this for this problem. And then, like you said, you know, you'll, you'll have a stomach problem from taking your medication. So you take something for the stomach problem that causes you insomnia. So you take something for insomnia, which causes you anxiety. So then you got to take something for it. It just keeps snowballing and snowballing. And next thing you know, you're taking 15 medications mm -hmm. and your stomach is like this chemistry set going on. And look what happens to the, all these stars. They drop dead of heart attacks in their sleep or whatever, and everybody's, oh, so surprised. Oh, I'm so surprised he died. W was it coke? Was it heroin? No, it was prescription drugs that killed him. Yeah. The sad thing is, is that with all of this radiation, your immune system and your bodily systems are going to wear themselves down, and you'll go to the doctor with maladies, and they're just going to give you more drugs. I mean, I honestly think that the reason why nothing is being done on a huge level uh, internationally is because there's more money to be made off of us. They'll make more money off of us being sick 
uh, then they're going to lose having to put it into trying to fix Fukushima. And I mean, if you remember, Christina, when um, the one scientist came out before the corium had had we thought melted out of containment um the scientist was saying we have to tunnel underneath fukushima and pour a concrete pad to prevent this corium from melting down into the ground and tepco's response to that was it's too expensive yeah yeah that's why they didn't do it and now it's too late to do it it is too late yeah I saw an article yesterday where um, the, some physicists said that it, the corium was probably eating through the concrete at 18 inches per day. So they're, so they're estimating that it's now like 50 to 60 feet under the plants, where um, the researchers at Kyoto University came out a few months ago and said their estimations had it 30 to 40 feet below the plant. When does that thing go? What is it called? Hydrovolcanic? Hydrovolcanic like explosion. Yeah, when, when does that hit? Well, it, <laughs> it's <laughs> thought that it would it would happen when it hit groundwater, but it, what it seems to be doing is steaming the groundwater out as radioactive steam. So there may be some kind of like low level hydrovolcanic thing going on under the plants right now, and probably has been for months. As far as being like a huge explosive event. So nobody, we might get lucky knows. because it's venting off because with, with the steam, but then it's not really lucky because it's radioactive steam and that's going out into the atmosphere and into the environment. Yeah. I so mean, we're screwed could, either way is what you're saying. It, well, it, it could it's be slow or fast. Right. I mean, it could be that it's just hitting a little bit of water now and it hasn't hit a big pocket. Right. You know, I mean, when that happens, who knows? They said that they didn't want to entomb it because they then it would... And this is funny because it's doing it anyway. But they said they didn't want to entomb it at first because then it would have burned down into the water table. And it's burning down into the water table anyway. Right. So obviously, you guys failed. I mean, this is this is astonishing to me that people think that, oh, well, you know, they're not really sure about what to do. Are you kidding me? You, If anybody can't see that this stuff is being done on purpose, I don't know what to tell you. This is not... Oh, Popeye, come on. You know, they, they're, they're just a little, they're just a bunch of screw-ups. You know how it is. Human, human nature. No, I'm sorry. We have satellites. We have the technology. I could read the tag on the back of my underwear from outer space. You're going to tell me we couldn't solve this mess? We've had this yeah. technology since the late 40s when we first started blowing bombs up with it and experimenting with it. And we stole the Nazis' bombs. By the way, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those weren't our bombs that we detonated. Those were bombs that we confiscated from the Nazi regime. So when you hear that the Nazis didn't have nukes, that's a lie. Because we blew up two of their bombs. It's in the history books. Yeah, oh. I just thought you guys would. Yeah, see? Little, little piece of history most people don't know. I know. Little little side caveat. But <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I guess the sad fact of the matter is, is that since they've let it go to this point, uh, now there really is nothing they can do about it. Yeah, maybe, maybe a bunch of s small things. To mitigate it, like back in July, the U.S. government was actually considering nuking that plant and blowing that. everything up into the air at once. Arnie Gunderson actually reported that. But the, they couldn't do it because Japan refused to evacuate Tokyo. And, and they still refuse. And they still refuse, and they're still going to have that problem if there is a hydrovolcanic explosion or the spent fuel pool falls. And I believe there's 33 million people in that city. Yeah, not there's to mention all the more. prefectures around there, all the little and the all the little tiny, uh, what do you call it? The little tiny like fishing villages and all that. All mm -hmm. those people out in the countryside. All have those it, kids it, going to school. Did you see we, the story about the parents asking the Japanese government to build like an indoor radiation-proof building for the kids to play in, so their kids don't have to go outside and play in radio uh, radioactive fallout? The fact that you have to ask your government. To do that because it, remember the government's supposed to be there to automatically think of this stuff so why do we have to tell them to do it why aren't they doing it that's something that people should be asking that's the main question why are the governments all over the all over the world japan united states canada wherever australia why are all these governments sticking their fingers in their ears and closing their eyes and going la 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 can't see it can't see it no radiation no radiation i don't know what you're talking about why are they doing that that's the question people should be asking. Good question. We'll be back in a few with Nuked Radio.
Um, I have an article up that I wanted to read an excerpt from. Uh, this was posted on Alexander Higgins' blog, May 19th of 2011. Confirmed, the EPA recalibrated, or rigged, Japan's nuclear radiation monitoring equipment, causing them to report lower levels of radioactive fallout after the Fukushima nuclear meltdown than what was detected before the disaster. And I don't have access to the 2010 graphs, but um, I know somebody who does, and she might be coming on the show next week, Lauren Murray. She was interviewed on ExoPolitics about this in the past. Um, he reprogrammed, uh, he programmed an application to pull all of the monitoring graphs to his site every day where they go into a graph, which is easy to read, but he also had um, some segments of graphs, particularly from the Sacramento area prior to the Fukushima meltdowns where you can see the um, normal background levels. And then March 11th, it appears that the monitors are turned way down because they're reading much lower. Hey, Christina. Yeah. If you remember when you and I first met, um, I actually had backdoor access to RadNet through some stuff that I used to do in a previous life and was able to pull down numbers for every major city in the U.S. from 2000 up until everything was shut off uh, in April of 2011. So I have every isotope, every reading from all the cities in a spreadsheet. So I don't know if uh, Lauren would be interested in that, but I do have that handy and I can send that to you. Okay, yeah, that'd be awesome. He asked in this article, who is responsible for assuring the system is up and running? The EPA contracted this responsibility to a private company called Environmental Dimensions, Incorporated. They've provided maintenance for the EPA's RADNET monitoring systems under a sole source contract, which can be viewed at the end of this article. The base amount of the contract is 238000 a year. This does not include materials and travel, which is billed back to the government as needed. The contract was awarded to what is stated as a woman-owned, small, disadvantaged business. This disadvantaged woman just happens to be Patricia S. Bradshaw, a former deputy under Secretary of Defense appointed by George Bush. So this, is the, lady, this is the lady in charge of the graph network. I had read, too, somewhere in there that they weren't even really maintaining them. No, and, and when they do, like, they don't have any kind of um, data that you can source, like, when do they change the filters? How long does it take to change a filter? You know, what happens when these graphs are offline? And there's supposed to be 129 cities uh, that are reporting data, but uh, probably um, 40, 40 of them or so don't work. Sometimes it's higher. Last week, every city from M, M through Z was offline from a few You're days kidding. ago. And um, Potter Blog, who's uh, looked through this extensively as it affects the St. Louis area, has pulled all the, the graph data from them and saw that they were taking sometimes when a plume came into St. Louis, they would take the monitor offline and say they're changing the filter, which is what they do because the particulate accumulates in the filter so it can make the numbers higher, but then they would leave it off for like five days. Well, there was an instance uh, right near the beginning of the disaster where uh, North Carolina had an insane reading. I mean, this is back when we had, like, the real city readings where you could just click on the city and see the real time. Yeah. It, it was over 21,000 counts per minute. And it had been up. I mean, it wasn't like it was stuck. It was adjusting itself, you know, in the 21,000s. And then it went offline and it stayed offline for weeks on end. Wow. I mean, for it to be that high and not cause other levels, up, you know, to go up around it, I would think it'd be local. And South Carolina has had some problems. Yeah. At, you know, North Carolina as well, especially Brunswick. But, you know, regardless of where it's coming from, you know, the mitigation for it is the same. And we were talking off air how, like, some of our, our like, general health has actually been improved by doing mitigation for rats, like we're noticing other benefits. I know I sleep better. Like calling all the heavy metals out of our bodies. I don't have stomach <laughs> problems anymore. Yeah. I'm much healthier now than I was doing, uh, especially the diatomaceous earth and just the vitamins and whatever. I mean, it helps a lot. Can you can feed that to your pets too. Yep. And your children. 
I have to look into that. You can use it as a uh, anti flea thing too. Yeah, it kills insects. You could put it around your sill plate. It'll kill spiders and bugs just as long as it doesn't get wet. But yeah, it's great stuff. I've been taking it for probably close to 10 months now and a huge difference in anyone with joint issues um it helps lubricate the joints the skin bentonite the hair clay, the right? nails uh, no the diatomaceous no earth. i know the diatomaceous earth yeah. but i mean bentonite clay too right like you, yeah you take, that helps well. that helps pull out toxins the only thing with bentonite clay is that it really really kills my stomach i could do it one day but day number two i start to feel weak because you get so dehydrated and you have to keep pounding water but uh, the DE doesn't do that to me. Yeah, so, I don't like it because it tastes like dirt. <laughs> what? The bentonite clay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I put it into a half a glass of orange <laughs> juice and then it just is, plug your nose. Technically, it is dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it works well. I mean, the, definitely bentonite or diatomaceous earth. You know, I try to do every couple weeks one dose of bentonite clay. And then just lots of raw vegetables and vitamins and exercise. Yeah, I've been taking vitamins and I've been exercising more. And uh, it's hard too, you know, especially you get out of, you know, you get out of the uh, the, the pattern of doing it every day. And, and something simple like I, I had so many operations in a row that I got, I wasn't able to go back to the gym for a while. And you, you, you quickly get off that cycle and you, you, you don't realize how it affects your health. You need to move around. You need to exercise. You need to eat right because our bodies on a cellular level, I had to say that slowly so I wouldn't screw it up, uh, they, uh, re they rebuild ourselves every seven years where our cells are replenished with new healthy cells. Well, where do you think those cells get their building blocks from? From what you eat, the nutrients you take in. So if you're taking in McDonald's, you're, that's why everybody looks so fat. That's why everybody is so disgusting. That's why everybody's – you know when they say, oh, we have an obesity problem in this country. Well, between all the fillers they put in the food, which your body can't do anything with, it can't process it, meaning it doesn't poop it out. So where does it go? It goes into your fat cells. It's the only other way your body can get rid of stuff. It, either you poop it out or it goes into your fat cells, and that's what happens. And, and then people's DNA are also changing because all the stuff that's in the food. So you end up with this fat, gloopy, blobby mess of, of a person because they're eating this crap food. Whereas if you see someone that eats healthy food, nu nutritious food, they start to actually lose weight and lean up because they don't have to – they don't have all that crap storing in their bodies. Right. It's all the toxins. And, I mean, all that crap that you're eating at fast food, who knows where any of that's coming from? You know, I mean, it, it could very well be irradiated. I mean, they're not doing any testing. Has there ever been any confirmation, Christina, about uh, the food testing that's coming into this country? I know that there were questions in the very beginning about uh, the stuff coming from Japan. And to my knowledge, they're still not doing any type of wide-scale testing. No, no, they're not. We're still importing um, milk products and beef products from Japan. In fact, that's reported on the EPA's website. And there's been a few independent researchers that had tested uh, milk and so forth, and some people on YouTube who have been doing that. And, um, you know, I mean, they're, they're definitely finding it not in everything. And, and the most advisable thing is to try to get, if you can still find, um, you know, like canned food, uh, especially if you're eating uh, tuna or anything like that, salmon, that you get pre-Fukushima canned stuff. Like John Stokes. Yeah, John Stokes was really smart to uh, to get a whole bunch of that right at the beginning. I saw a story late last night um, about uh, sushi. There's some new sushi that they're marketing in Japan that's glow in the dark. No now, way. Yeah, wait. I'll have to find the story and drop <laughs> that to you. Because when I saw it, I was like, now, either this is some really smart marketing ploy to the teenagers of Japan, like, look at how cool it is that we have this glow-in-the-dark sushi. Or, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it seemed like a psyop to me. Eat it because it's cool. Yeah, I used to have sushi, like, twice a week before Fukushima, and I think I've had it twice in the past year. Uh, I don't eat fish. Never did. Or drink milk. So it was kind of easy for me to give those up. 
you know, Tokyo is a real, real problem. In fact, there was another article I'm posted on any news today or a professor, Masayoshi Yamamoto, discussed his plutonium findings and said that he was very surprised near Awaki, which is 50 kilometers south, halfway to Tokyo, that the ratio of plutonium-239, which is weapons grade, is 200 times the government estimate, showing that uh, much more is being detected than what they have indicated. And he used a word called fractionation to account for the high levels. And we've heard this word before from Chris Busby, who used it in relation to the explosion at Reactor 3, where he said because of the MOX fuel, the uranium oxide is a different temperature than the plutonium oxide, and that when they melt, they don't mix together, and that's what caused the explosion. So at any rate, um, we'll cover some of the news on over the weekend on Monday. We'll be talking to Lauren Murray next week. Hopefully we can get Kevin back here to share his detox info with us. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Jules. Thank you, Popeye. Thanks, Christina. Thanks for having Great me Great show. Have yeah. a good weekend, everybody. Stay safe.